Hey everyone, uh, this is Zucky Munyan from Sommelier Protocol, and I am uh, chatting with Nick and Yinwen from the uh, from Perpetual Protocol. Um, you guys are well known for being like one of the uh, one of the protocols that has sort of you know built one of the uh, uh, a decentralized version of one of the killer centralized exchange protocols, Perpetual Swaps. Um, so yeah, it's really great to meet you guys. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Um, so maybe you could tell me a little bit about yourselves, how you got into the the DeFi blockchain space, um, and uh, and how it's and you know sort of what Perpetual Protocol is is doing right now. Sure, of course. Uh, let me start first. Um, so I I mean I I kind of fell down the crypto rabbit hole in two thousand. 17, 18. So when we see the crypto TT, that's uh, really amazing. Uh, I used to, I mean, I build games. So I kind of feel that, uh, you know, we, sh we should be able to do something like crypto TT on blockchain. But uh, after some like just boring, I think it's really hard. So we actually kind of pivot and then, uh, um, and then do like a lot of surveys. And then we want to kind of build derivative on top of Ethereum. Uh, so it's actually 2018, and uh, we actually kind of like designed a new protocol for options. So you can trade options on um, Ethereum, which is uh, it, it's it's really interesting concept. But uh, at the time, I think we are kind of like too ahead of our time. So I mean, it actually failed. So we ended up like uh, doing, I mean, joining. Uh, so we talked Binance a lot. So we joined Binance Lab incubator at that time and then working on other things and um, fast forward to uh, 2019 2020 we see the success of uniswap and also syntax so we feel that you know, uh, i mean like we should go back to DeFi. i mean like uh, this is i mean where the growth at so we kind of like go back to derivative and then uh it, i mean after like two years i mean like at 2019 I think the concept, I mean, the concept of a and M is really, I mean, I mean, it's great. I mean, like we, we never thought about that in 2018. We don't think that it will got so many, tra so many traction. So, I mean, like we end up like trying to design an a and for derivative and then we pick perpetual swap. So that's kind of like how we start. So fast forward to now, the protocol has launched like over seven months. And uh, I think we got a pretty good traction. So, I mean, like the total trading volume is over 20 billion. We took wow. probably a 70, 80% of the kind of like derivative market, decentralized derivative market. So yeah, so things are going well and uh, we are working on a V2 right now. Yeah, yeah, that's about it. Nick? Uh, yeah, so, super quick one from, from me, I guess I started in, in the crypto space in kind of 2013, uh, I got goxed, so I kind of left um, <laughs> for a bit. Uh, came back in kind of 2016 and ran a friends and family arbitrage fund. Uh, kind of left again to join a fintech uh, based out in, in in Sydney, and then finally around just before kind of Uni V2 launched, I, I, I kind of started exploring the space and came back, uh, started helping a bunch of projects, and then kind of. Uh, fell in love with kind of DeFi and, and then joined Perp um, and, and have kind of been there ever since. So, what? So you know the the idea of an AMM for 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 derivative, the AMM for perpetual swap is pretty pretty a pretty different idea than you know either the traditional like AMM for in the spot market. You know, okay, so like there, there's a bunch of observations here, right? One is it's one of the things that's interesting and like observable about the sort of crypto market structure is the um, in centralized, in sort of the centralized exchange world, price discovery is all in, in derivatives, it's all in perpetuals uh, for most major crypto assets. Um, in the DeFi world, price discovery is still primarily in spot. Um, and I think you could sort of maybe attribute that to the success of the Uniswap style automated market maker for, for spot markets, 
So maybe you could talk a little bit about what makes an AMM for perpetual, for like per, for perps special. Um, that's a good question. So um, it's um, so I think um, let me start with the design. So I mean, it's actually more complicated than the I mean than most of the AMM you see in the spot market. Uh, of course, I think Uniswap V3 actually is pretty complicated, so kind of like us. But uh, um, so um, I think there are actually different approach that like different teams want to build, uh, you know, a, a kind of like derivative AM either on like perpetual, I mean, swap contract or like on options or like interest rate swap. But uh, I think uh, the problem that most team face, I mean, face is that um, either like eight another dimension so like if you add leverage you know you kind of like need to think about lots of extra things only by adding leverage so like options they add the time component to that so you need to think about the time decay or like um i mean like um so that's i think that's a uh, lots of things that um, you know you need to i mean even by just by changing a little bit on the you know um just just again one dimension it changed a lot. So um, I think they are, I mean, but th this is very interesting. So I think we are kind of a wonderful team like working on this like, for a long time. So I think we are really good at like try to create this virtual asset and then and then kind of like, place those assets onto a traditional like spot market a and m and then make it, I mean, and, and then kind of like uh, have leverage on top of it. Um, as to the market, um, I think that the small market, small market AM is still like, um, you know, have the major market share, mostly because, um, I mean, for the derivative that the, the perpetual contract we are working on, we are still kind of like that behind the essentialized exchange, especially on the usability, I mean, um, you know, essentially, I, I mean, like RFKX, it actually provides more features. It actually provides, I mean, like it's faster, it's more responsive. So I think we kind of like scale that behind than the centralized counterparts, counterpart. So, you know, it still takes time for us to reach it, but uh, I think it's, it's, I mean, they are like slowly, I mean, lots of new improvement like there to, you know, like, um, you know, we, we, we kind of like know more on like how to design this kind of AM so we can add in more features. So definitely I think in probably like one or two years, I think we should be able to catch up to the century change. Yeah. Nick, do you have anything that you want to add? Uh, not really. I mean, or, or, I guess the only point really potentially is, is around kind of how, how the AMMs kind of came about. And I think most of it has just been due to kind of the underlying Ethereum blockchain and kind of the the constraints of uh, the constraints of it, right? Like an order book doesn't work on it, and so we've kind of seen this uh, this innovation in in the forms of AMM come out. Um, and I think that's kind of quite interesting, and I suspect we're going to see it continuing forward, where kind of taking something old that kind of might work in Web two or kind of traditional finance may not kind of work in uh, in the world that we're living in now. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, if you think about kind of like a like a regular exchange and kind of like the order book uh, model, uh, it, it kind of requires extremely high throughput. Um, yeah. And by I guess by default, like Ethereum, like uh, back in DeFi summer, like gas costs skyrocketed all the way to kind of eight hundred GUE in in some instances, right? So and so even just a uh, uh, removing kind of liquidity and replacing it on all the book is kind of just in, in like just not feasible. And so the the AMM was kind of a, a, con a construct that was kind of born from it um, in order to allow for this kind of price discovery, I guess, uh, without having to, to face the throughput limitations of, of Ethereum. Uh, obviously, we're kind of Ethereum's getting better with kind of ETH layer 2 and, and, and kind of L2s that are coming out. But um, th there's still going to be these limitations. And so I think what will be really interesting is we're going to find the same, uh, there's going to be similar kind of innovations that happen 
um, in the space uh, and it'll be better uh, as a whole down the line. So I've been of the opinion for a while that while AMMs have this constraint, like, yes, they, they function well in con computationally constrained environments, um, but like the, the concentrated, the move towards concentrated liquidity has made AMMs much more like order books. What the real key thing that I think is interesting is this question uh, is like the AMM, I think AMMs really took off when liquidity mining was introduced. And like that's the thing that you can't really do um, in, a, in a centralized order book or an order book generally is like, is have this like locked liquidity, liquidity mining um, kind of construct. Um, and I think that's like one of the sort of real keys to all of this. Do people incentivize liquidity on, on, on perpetual protocol today? Do like projects like uh, 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 incentivize price discovery in, on their perps on perpetual protocol like they do incentivized liquidity on on uh, on Uniswap V2. Is there is does that has that happened yet? Um, no, we don't. We don't incentivize liquid, liquidity. We. I mean, we you, I, not, I'm not even just saying you guys. Like in theory, like someone else could, right? Like, there's, is there yeah. is there any reason why you couldn't incentivize LP shares? Like, like I can mm -hmm. have like a, a, a staking gauge contract. Yeah, for, yeah, for definitely. definitely. But actually, I kind of like, um, I also think that um, the central exchange can do this. I mean, like, like you know, they, they actually kind of incentivize the market makers. So, you know, uh, you always, uh, you know, uh, for the market maker you have, they always have this kind of agreement that if you can keep the, I mean, the sweat like within a certain range, and then, you know, you got a free discount. I mean, just, yeah, true. just because they don't do this like, so aggressively, aggressively like you know defy i think they still can do this but uh you know just in a way sure no no mm -hmm. i well like the i think what's cool about mm -hmm. amms and liquidity money is it's like in a centralized exchange it's like you know finance can incentivize market makers yeah because they see everything right and they have yeah. enough data then to like understand like whether or not anyone is gaming is like gaming their incentive program and they, mm -hmm. they know who the market makers are um mm -hmm. but it's all you know but you know this model of like paying market makers um of like projects when they launch and paying market makers to to, to provide liquidity on centralized exchange it's always been a really tricky thing right it's mm -hmm. always been it's you've never really understood exactly what you were getting for what you were paying for um as like a project um um you yeah. know that like that you know is trying is trying to sort of get a token out into the world um and i think the the elegance of it is it's not you know uniswap's ability or curve's ability to mine to provide liquidity mining, it's been like the third party project's ability to incentivize um, that I think has, has been interesting. And I guess it's like, a, I think it's an interesting question as to like when that would also come to like the perpetual market in DeFi. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So actually I totally agree. I think that Uniswap actually, I mean, kind of like, so, Traditionally, you cannot be market maker. You know, like you know, on a central exchange, market maker earn a lot of money, but uh, you know, it's always like private deal. So you you are not able to participate that. But on you know on Uniswap, a retail can participate that. You know, you, you just like kind of like provide liquidity. So I think that actually changed a lot of things, especially on like Uniswap v three. So the same I think on perpetual. I mean, at least on like perpetual protocol, because I think we have this uh, very interesting design in our V1 that uh, we don't need a great provider. So that's actually the reason that we don't have any this kind of program. But in B2, actually we are, so, so they will be a great provider. So we definitely will run some program, I mean, for a great provider. And the great provider, you know, doesn't need to be like, you know, market maker, like, you know, or like, a, institution or like, you know, like special rule, rule. 
I mean, just like everyone can be that, and then everyone can earn. I mean, the the fee rebate. I also see that、um, you know the the Uniswap or now we are Uniswap three, Uniswap two or or,、um, or other like AM. I mean, I mean、um, projects. The liquidity provider actually earns hundred percent of of the fees, or maybe like eighty percent of the fees. But compared to central exchange, liquidity provider or market maker, they only you know got some rebates. So I think that's also very different. So you know,、um, on Uniswap V two or V three, becoming the liquidity provider actually can. I mean, you have a a, a very large like design space that、like、you can build an algorithm because the fee. Actually, is like hundred percent. So you can actually do lots of things in order to earn the fees. So I think that's、uh, also very different from central exchange environment. Yeah, I, I'm very curious. I don't. I feel like I just like, like, I, I I've I've periodically looked at uh, at at uh, your V1 protocol, but I've never fully like sort of brought, like absorbed it into my brain. So.、Mm-hmm. Um, Yeah, this comment about how you don't have liquidity providers yet you're an AMM,、uh, like I was like, I'm like, you want to tell me how that works? How how do you have、yeah. an an AMM without liquidity providers? And then why are you bringing in liquidity providers in in V two? <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure.、Uh, yeah, that's、uh, um, so. Let me let me explain like how it works in V one now first and.、Uh, Um, and then you 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 will kind of I see the reason that we are going to bring them back in V two. So,、uh, for 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 perpetual protocol, I mean like、um, if we look at the protocol itself, actually we have kind of a two functional unit. So the first one is that、um, the trader can put in collateral, and then we mint virtual token. So we we have like this unit that、uh, you know we will. Take the collateral and then I、like, store it in a vault, and then being virtual token based on the leverage you want. If you want to mint, if you put in like hundred USDC, you want to have like two as leverage, we will mint two hundred virtual USDC for、yeah. you. So that's one part. The second part is kind of like a pricing engine. So in Perp V one, we actually kind of like have this like the same as in V two. We have this SYK model. So. We are, so like like、um, like pre- previous we say that the, so two hundred virtual USDC we actually put that onto Uniswap V two the curve and then we take something I mean、um, let me give you a concrete example so we have so suppose that we are trading on a virtual ETH market so ETH market so ETH USDC so which means that we can mint virtual ETH and virtual USDC so. For example, Alice want to come in. She put in a hundred USDC, two X average. We mean two, two two hundred virtual USDC for her, and then she put in this SYK model. Suppose I, you know, in this model there are some already some token there. So, so let's say that、uh, you know they are like、uh, like like ten thousand USDC and a hundred ETH there, which means that this price is hundred. And、um, we put in like a two hundred virtual USDC in the virtual USDC pool, and then take something out from the virtual ETH pool. So that's actually your own position.、Um, it's a little bit complicated, but、uh, you, so in this scenario, actually there is no liquidity provider because everything is virtual. So the question is that how much virtual ETH or virtual USDC we put in? When we create this Uniswap pool, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah, so so if we don't change the K, so we don't change the I mean the pool side. I mean the I mean the the tokens in the pool. Actually, we kind of have this virtual liquidity, and we don't need any asset to back that up. Which also means that we don't need a quick provider if we don't want to change K. So but that's how we design, and、um, because Uniswap、uh, is SYK, so it's actually pass independent. So we can make sure that all the I mean, 
Olga Gong position, I mean, so there are people like taking on a short position in this way. And then once we close all of the position, you were back to the original state. So which means that um, everyone should be paid out. I mean, uh, there is no like, um, you know, uh, p &L in the AM. So that's how the V1 designed. Um, so for, uh, but you actually have like some issues. So, uh, so for V2, we want to, the thing we want to do is that the first thing is that we want to be more like capital efficient because V1, we use this as like, hey, so it's, uh, it's not so capital efficient. So we want to, I mean, be more capital efficient. So that's, um, so the second thing that we want to solve is that, uh, um, it's a little bit complicated, but uh, at any given time, uh, because, I mean, like we have this virtual equity, so the AMM doesn't really participate in the market. So like um, it should, I mean, like the, the, the vote should have like uh, every collateral that pay back to, to the traders. But at the funding time, the things is a little bit different because um, on the AMM, at any given time, if there is like um, some traders placing, I mean, open any positions, then there should be like more longs than shorts or more shorts than longs. So our AM actually when funding, because funding payment, you have to have equal amount of long and short. So the AM will participate in the funding payment that actually creates some risk to the system. So bringing the uh, liquidity provider can make sure that we have enough long and short. So remove AM from the funding payment. So that's the second thing we want to fix. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's basically about it. But um, yeah, um, it's still be like, there are lots of details in the, in the design, but uh, yeah, I hope that uh, it is going well. That's really fascinating. Um, I wanted to shift topics a little bit to uh, the other thing that we sort of touched on a little bit, which was um, improving user experience. So what are your thoughts on sort of the emerging L2 layer, L2 experience? Um, you know, uh, is Perpetual Protocol V2 going to launch on an L2? How is that, how's, how, how's that thought process going for you guys? Yeah, um, from, I, I think from a, from a user experience perspective, there's kind of, there's two angles we can have a we, we need to look at i guess the first one from a from a community perspective is kind of non-defi native users how do we get them in and i think there's a lot of work that needs to be done from even from a user experience and kind of from an education perspective if you talk to a lot of um like non-retail users and you tell them that they have to basically trust all their money in in like a chrome extension like metamask or something um they usually take a double take right um but if, if we then look at kind of user experience within kind of the DeFi community, I think the one we've chosen for the time being, at least, is, is Arbitrum. Um, and I think uh, the, the key around here is, is a composability. So the ability for someone or individuals to kind of go into an ecosystem uh, and interact without kind of having to change chains and, and kind of think about that, I think that's going to be the first like really key point. And then the second key point really is then uh, allowing for developers who are, I guess, another type of user um, to be able to build products uh, with all these kind of financial products that, that are now composable. And this kind of opens up a design space that, that you normally haven't seen in traditional finance before. Um, where traditionally, like to get a partnership running, it like takes uh, quite a long time. It's quite permissioned and, and, and it's it's only for a very limited amount of parties. Whereas now you can basically take, you can take any three AMMs that you want throw in a perpetual product plus some lending and off you go, you can build some product uh, on top of that. That's fascinating. And yeah, I'm a huge fan of Arbitrum. Um, it is, uh, I, I like the team a lot. I've known them for a long time. I like the, uh, 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 like the approach is very, very powerful. Uh, it's also incredibly complicated. Just looking at the code like a few weeks ago, it's just an unbelievably complex system, but very, very exciting. Um, cool. Um, is there anything else that's coming up that you guys want to talk about? 
Yeah, sure. So we have this like V2 that uh, it should be launched like, in, I mean, in coming months. So, um, so I think in V2, like I said before, that uh, you know we it's more uh, capital efficient. So it's, I mean, uh, because of uh, we are actually building on top of Uni V3. So like, um, so like equity provider can have their own strategy. They can build their own strategy, just like traditional market maker. And then they still earn like most of the fees from the platform. So I think that's really cool. And um, the second thing we are going to have is that uh, is uh, the permissionless market creation. So um, like uh, so like uh, in our V1, all the market we need to create a governance vote, and then people have to vote on that. But uh, in V2, we are going to have this like anyone. If you can provide like um, some insurance fund, I mean for the system, then you know you, you can I mean you can create the market that you want. So like um, you know like uh, any market that like new tokens or like um, you know like mean tokens or anything. So if you I mean if there's uh, someone can provide some uh, security or liquidity to that, that market, then they can launch that market. So I think that's really cool as well. And the third thing that we want to improve is definitely the usability side. So one thing is that we we are moving to, I mean, moving from SKY to Arbitron, it definitely increase the, the the bandwidth, the throughput we have. And uh, the second, so it will be like much faster. The second thing is that we will, I mean, bring like more features like from AppKX, like cost margin, like multi collateral. So uh, so it will like make the life of traders so easy. And then, um, I mean, uh, so that's definitely like something we want to push out in this V2. This is, I mean, these features sound really exciting to me. Um, and for what Sommelier is building in terms of automated rebalancers, you know, having more markets is just so exciting. I, I, I hadn't really thought, of, I, I, you know, I, right now I'm, I, I'm spending a lot of my time thinking about, you know, rebalancer profitability. Um, for in the Uniswap v3 world, where um, the challenge is really the, the the losses you take from rebalancing, right? Like rebalancing is a lossy function. Um, like you, you you sort of lose money on rebalancing, um, yeah. and that offsets your gains on your yields on on you know, your profits from from being a liquidity provider. I haven't even begun to think about what that looks like in a in a world where what you're providing is liquidity to a perpetual rather than and with leverage. Uh, rather than, uh, 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 and maybe, so, you know, like my, my general insight into the, mm -hmm. into the spot market LP in world is that none of this is really going to work at scale until we figure out a way to compose liquidity positions with options positions with like futures basically. Um, so that you can be, cause you know, the, the liquidity position in, in, in the spot market is basically short volatility. And so you can be market neutral by being short volatility in spot and long volatility in the options market. Hmm. And that's really going to be the key to making the spot market liquidity work. Um, I think it's beyond the scope of this conversation to like try and think of like what, what strategies will work in perpetual liquidity, but I, I'd be very excited to continue this conversation. Yeah, actually, yeah, I think the thing you mentioned is like, it's it's very interesting yeah i never yes i think that uh, you know kind of like having a way to kind of like um you know um kind of move the risk to other like financial product i think that's definitely something that um i mean like um the 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 liquidity provision on uni v3 i mean can can do um one thing i want to add on the i mean on the on the liquidity provide uh, provision on like perpetual protocol i think if we if we are interested in, in doing that, it's actually more like traditional market market making. So because on a perpetual market, you actually can get long and short position on yep. the market same market. So I think actually your goal is more like you want to minimize, you know, the, the position you own. Yeah. So so it's actually very different from a little bit different from Uni V3. So yeah, you should be yeah you should be able to kind of bring the knowledge of like traditional market making, and then into like perpetual market making. So, uh, I think that uh, you, you know you can kind of like um, 
try to balance, but using long and short. I think that's more straightforward. That sounds very interesting. And I'm, I, I'm actually really excited now uh, to, to <laughs> learn more. So very excited about the V2 launch. And uh, thank you guys for your time. Cool, cool. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, nice talking to you. And it was really nice thanks meeting you. Us. Yeah. Hopefully, I'll see you at a conference sooner rather than later. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, guys.